Oh. And the meeting is all yours. Uh, introducing Barbara Chung. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Brent. And thank you um, to Brent and Chris and the chapter board for inviting me to speak with you all. It's um, And thank you as well to everybody who's joining. Then, and um, here are some of the stories I have to tell about the garden. So it's a brief background on me, as Brent mentioned, I am a writer and a poet. I am also, um, I'm also professionally, I've spent about 15 years working in strategic finance, first in-house, now I do it as a consultant. And um, the other thing I am is a lover of California's native plants and of California. And so what I'm going to do today is bring you into my garden. Um, I love having people over my garden. I love having guests. And so um, even though I can't bring you in physically, I'm hoping that I can give you a little bit of a virtual visit here. Okay, so first of all, to set some context. Um, so just would love you to come into my garden. It, is um, what we're looking at here is when you step onto the back patio and you look to the right. So this is about half of the garden. So. And um, this garden, it's home to over 200 plants, um, about two thirds na California natives. And they are all in containers because all the space I have, it's, um, it's brick lines. So I live in a townhouse in Santa Monica. And so what I have is a back patio that measures um, seven by 20 feet, as you see, and a front, little front porch that measures about two by five feet. And um, as I mentioned, the garden itself is about two thirds natives. And then I have a little home nursery in um, that somehow squeezed in as well, um, which yielded a couple hundred plants in 2021, and then about 400 plants last year. And I'll speak a little bit more to that and um, why I have a nursery as well as a garden, a mini nursery as it were. Um, so as I mentioned, I don't have land, I don't have direct access to ground, everything is brick line, but even without land and in this small space, I've learned that these plants can still pack a big punch, a small space can pack a very big punch. And so it became a certified wildlife habitat in the fall of 2021. And I'll speak to a bit more about this one. Just set the stage for um, the garden and what it's like. And so the first thing I want to talk about is how did this happen? How did I end up with over 200 plants in this small space? And honestly, the first and most important answer, it's very simple. I, I wanted a garden. Um, I had started some plants there, succulents and things like that, you know, drought tolerant plants, but a few years ago, I started learning more about native plants and I just fell in love with them and with their beauty and the way that they belong in this place and what they can do for wildlife and for um, this natural world that we live in. And so I wanted to be able to bring these plants that I was falling in love with into my garden space. And um, that was simply how it started. And then um, what happened was I, I just started hearing, I, I would hear people in the native plant world say, you know, native plants, they belong in the ground. They have to go in the ground. Um, like, yeah, simply that native plants belong in the ground. And I understand how that's true with things like oak trees and so on that have those deep tap roots and need a lot of space. But me at this time, not knowing honestly much about plants, being very enthusiastic, enthusiastic, but not very knowledgeable, I would hear people say, oh, natives belong in the ground. And it just sat kind of funny with me because if you're saying that you have to have land in order to have native plants, in a way, what you're saying is that you have to have privilege in order to have native plants because land means you have privilege. And to me, it just felt exclusive and counterintuitive and it just, I believe that people are meant to be a part of the natural world and to connect with it. And so I just decided that I wanted to prove that 
we can be a part of the natural world and we can bring it into our homes, even in an urban setting, even without land, even without lots of money that it could be possible. And so um, I wanted to show it was possible. And so I started adding plants and I mentioned here on the slide that most of the plants were free. And I love saying that and I do say it a lot because I think everyone should be able to have plants and I want this to be accessible to everyone. So for context of the 200 plus plants that I have, I paid money for nine of them. So when I say most of the plants were free, I really mean it. And, and I want to be very clear here. I think it's so important to support native plant nurseries to support local businesses. We have some amazing native plant nurseries in our community in Southern California, and we should absolutely support them. But at the same time, I have a garden with over 200 plants. And if I had bought every one of those plants, in the, even in a four inch pot or one gallon pot, it would have cost over $2,000. And that's not necessarily accessible, right? And so, I really want to do this in a way that was accessible and approachable. So a lot of my plants, I grew them from seeds and from cuttings. Um, so whether I bought the seeds or seeds were gifted to me um, or cuttings gifted from friends' gardens. Um, my entire Dudley collection, um, I call it the friendship bracelet collection because it is all either cuttings from friends' gardens or um, gifted to me um, as well by friends who had propagated them. And so it's important, I think, to make sure even down up the chain, rather up the supply chain, even if you're growing your own plants, to make sure that they are open to this list. And then I also had plants that were gifted by like-minded friends. I see a number of them on the call tonight, and I'm so grateful. And I want to say that every when I look at my garden, one day I kind of tallied up, I'm like, how many people have given something to this garden, either seeds or cuttings or plants? And it was over 20 people. And so it's funny because I had started out wanting to do this in a way that was financially accessible, but the plants they became, the garden became really an emblem and a testament to the community and how people who love plants and care for the natural world can really come together to create something beautiful. So. Um, the majority of my plants, as I mentioned, I propagated some were gifted from friends, um, some I salvaged from sites where they were weeds. I um, spent two days weeding a native plant nursery where there were certainly invasives that were coming up through the ground, but there were also uh, natives that just also needed to be cleared up, um, to get cleared out to keep the place clean and you know, functioning well. And so I took home some monkey flowers and willow herb and um, things like that, just pulled them up out of the ground, stuck them in some dirt, and shockingly, a lot of them survived. And so on their plants, I can trace back to days of weeding. And then um, lastly, it's a fun one, um, some of my plants volunteered. So you think of a container garden as being very structured and contained and organized, but I have found it also spirals widely out of control. So um, for example, I sowed some chia in one pot at one end of my patio. And six months later, I'm finding chia sprouting from hanging baskets on the other end of my patio 20 feet away. And I have no idea how that happened. Um, but I love that the garden is taking on a life of its own. So um, I want to bring you into the garden and take a closer look at the garden's arrangement. And so well, I've lived in small spaces most of my adult life. And I have found that when you live in a small space, if you don't stay organized, you very quickly end up just wallowing in squalor. And so I like to stay organized in my home and I like to stay organized in the garden. And even though it's a small space, if it's organized, it'll feel bigger. So I've divided into these kind of five groups and the first I call aromatherapy. So, you know, sages and sagebrush and things like that. And that's very much a subset of the coastal sage scrub community. Um, and so that's kind of that second group of like coastal sage scrub as well as chaparral, 
And then I also have a small nursery, as I mentioned, where I propagate um, mostly native plants and also some edible plants and medicinal plants um, for myself and for family and for friends. And those first three sections, I'm going to dive into more detail in the following slide on the following slides. So I won't speak to them too much here, but the last two sections, I will go into a little more detail because I won't be bringing them up again. So the kitchen section is food plants. And um, I find, at least for me with food plants, maybe because I'm, I'm growing non-native food plants, they are very resource intensive and they take more water, they take more fertilizer and obviously they take up my limited space. And so I try to grow things that I can't get at the grocery store um, because that's, that, that space and those resources are precious. So. What you see pictured here is called the Buena Mulata pe um, pepper plant, or chili pepper plant, Capiscum annuum, Buena Mulata. And it has a really interesting history um, when I say that I like to kind of put in things that are a bit unusual. So taking a step back in history, around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, there were thriving African-American catering communities in Baltimore and Philadelphia. And they propagated a lot of chili peppers that were unique to their cuisine. And then over the course of the following decades, um, many of these were lost. But one day, a gentleman, I think it was in like the 1950s or so, he was in his grandfather's basement looking for something. He opened a drawer and he found all these packets of seeds. And it turned out a lot of these were seeds of the plants I had mentioned. And one of the packets was labeled Pippin and Bonamolata. And it turned out that these peppers were a favorite of the African-American painter Horace Pippin. Um, as you can see from the colors of the peppers there, um, they would appeal to an artist and that he would use these seeds to pay for things within the community. And so I got the seeds um, from a Twitter friend in Vermont who mailed a dozen seeds to me. And I propagated them, kept a couple for myself, gave some away. And then um, and the next chapter of the story is that along the way and on Instagram, um, a, a community garden in South Central LA started following me and I was following them back and, um, and following the work that they do, which is amazing and actually focusing a lot on food plants and solving food desert issues in the area. And the garden, um, the stewards of the garden want to focus especially on ancestral foods, so African foods and African American foods. And when I learned that, I was like, well, I, I've got some seeds I can share. Um, and so I've been mailing seeds to the stewards of the garden. And then that became a relationship. And so I think it speaks to both, it speaks to kind of the history that plants, not just native plants, really, but all plants can share and the community that they can build. Um, and speaking of community, the last area I'll speak to is succulents, which is how I started my garden. I think a lot of you probably know that succulents are easy tending, a wonderful entryway for plant lovers. And so when I have friends or neighbors who say, oh, I would love to have a garden, but I could never. And I have a brown thumb. I'm not good at taking care of plants. I'm like, you know, here's a little jade in a pot and just see how it goes because these plants are forgiving and um, easy and it kind of, it's like the gateway plant. It gets people really excited about tending these living beings. And so that's why I keep my succulent collection going as well. So as I mentioned, we'll do a deep dive into those first three categories I mentioned or the sections. And the first is aromatherapy. So as I mentioned, I have a small space and very intentionally in a small space, want to cloud it with as much fragrance and aroma as I possibly could. So um, you'll see some examples here. 
that first picture is actually very confusing. What it is, it's a lilac verbena and a sagebrush that are sitting next to each other. And it looks like it's become one plant, but really they're just, they're just holding hands. Um, I've got loads of sagebrush, of course, and then hummingbird sage and purple sage in the background, um, La Pichonia fragrance, a fragrant pitcher sage, um, which is just incredible in terms of the aroma. And so I will say one of my favorite things to do every day is go out on my patio first thing in the morning, 6 a.m., and just breathe in the fra fragrance because it really collects in there with the marine layer that comes in. Um, I live about a mile and a half from the ocean, so very close to the shore. And between the marine layer and these plants and the closeness of the space is just this gorgeous, enchanting fragrance and a wonderful way to start the day. Um, as I mentioned, those are obviously a subset of the coastal sage scrub and chaparral community. Um, so you'll see some examples of the chaparral community. For example, here in the left frame, um, I have a chaparral bush poppy there, um, a few different kinds of dudleyas, uh, penstemon spectabilis, the snowy penstemon in the background, um, sage bush as well. The thing I want to highlight on this page is with that point is that starting with these kinds of plants was my saving grace in starting a container garden because I didn't really know what I was doing. I started putting the first plants I learned about, which were plants of these communities. And I made many mistakes when I started, um, but I would say the single biggest mistake of all is that I didn't know that native plants in containers do need fertilizer. Um, they don't need a lot, but they need something. And it doesn't even have to be synthetic fertilizer. It can be organic things like worm castings, but they need some food. And I'd always heard um, rightly that native plants don't need fertilizer and they grow in the wild without amendments. And all of that is true, but containers are a different matter because when you water, because they're not being replenished by surrounding ground, when you water them, eventually the nutrients do leach out. So. I didn't know any of that. So I um, did not feed the plant. And on top of that, I planted them all in spent soil. So it wasn't even fresh potting soil that came from Ace Hardware that had like some nutrients in it. It was spent soil. So it was completely depleted. So the headline that maybe I should have started with is that I had my first cohort of plants on a starvation diet for the first 10 months that I had them. And they all survived. I didn't lose one. And then when I got the memo and I started feeding them a little bit, they really started to thrive. And so as I'm so grateful to these plants for forgiving me and for forgiving my mistake and for glowing up regardless of the rough start that I gave them. And uh, I just, yeah, I don't think I can say enough about that, how grateful I am for the forgiveness that they extended to me. Um, speaking of mistakes, and maybe this is my mistake page, um, another thing I noticed is of my 200 plus plants or so, I uh, three of them died prematurely. So, um, and the pattern I noticed was that every one of those three was a desert plant. And I had thought, I love desert plants. I love our native desert plants. And I thought that you know, if I adjusted soil and watering accordingly, like it would be okay in a coastal climate. Um, they were not okay in a coastal climate. They held on as long as they could. Most of them lived one to two years, but they never really thrived. They never really glowed up and eventually um, they gave up. And so as much as I love desert plants, I know I can't put any here. Um, but everything you lose is a step you take. And the thing that taught me was to really lean into the microclimate that I do have. And um, as I noticed that the desert plants were the ones I was losing, I also noticed that the um, plants that did exceptionally well in this environment, they all had words like sea or ocean or coast or island in them. Oh, I, I see what's happening here. And so, um, I 
I, when I organize the garden, I like to group together plants that grow together in the wild. Um, I realize they're not on the ground together, but I still think they're happier when they're um, with their closest friends. So in the center panel here, you'll see what I call my seaside section. So seaside daisy, sea cliff buckwheat, um, thrift sea pink, and big sur manzanita. And then here on the right side, you see the big sur manzanita in its first bloom. And the way that these plants are in the garden, I mean, their happiness is almost tangible. And I don't know how better to explain it than that. But I, it's almost like the moment that they settle in, they just, they feel that they're home and their happiness is so almost physically tangible that it brings me a lot of joy as well. And so, that is, for me, it was a lot of the initial appeal to native plants was the idea of planting plants that work that work with the environment, not against it or in spite of it. And so I'm still learning what that means, but I've certainly learned um, to lean into my local seaside climate. Uh, so the, the mini nursery. So as I mentioned, the mini in the mini nursery, I grow mostly natives, some edibles, um, some medicinal plants and things like that. Um, the biggest project that I did with them for the first two years that existed, uh, 2021 and 2022, is kind of a mini grassland project, um, mini grassland restoration that I've taken in hand. So my parents live in Northern California, where I grew up, and my mother is the most amazing gardener that I know. So when they moved to where they live now, um, it was a couple of acres of bare land, mostly covered in wild oats and mustard, you know, as you see in a lot of places here. And over the last few decades, my mom transformed about half of it, one acre into this gorgeous garden. Um, she loves ornamentals. So there are roses and hydrangeas, um, manages the watering very carefully because as we know, water is a scarce and expensive resource. So they use drip irrigation and so on, but basically she turned it from just a weed infested wasteland into a beautiful fragrant garden. And then the other half of her property um, or their property sits on a pretty steep hillside and it's really not feasible to irrigate it in any way. Um, and so they had just left it alone over the years. My mom threw down, uh, she threw, in her words, millions of California poppy seeds on that hillside, trying to at least get some wildflowers or something, and nothing. It was just wild oats and mustard year after year. And so this got to the point where she would just sort of look at it and sigh, but didn't think she could do much about it. And then a few years ago, I started learning about native plants. And, you know, as most of us know, I think that they can thrive without irrigation um, if they're set up for success. And it's like, oh, there could be something interesting here. So I dove in, talked to a lot of people, did a lot of reading and research. Um, can't recommend the UCANR grassland manual highly mm -hmm. enough. And what I learned was um, a couple of things. I learned that wild oats suppress poppy seed germination and growth. So my mom had been throwing all the seeds down there for years, but they were never germinating or growing because the land was covered in wild oats. And then I also learned that Cyphochlocra, purple needle grass, can outcompete wild oats. Um, but ideally, it needs to be given a head start in the nursery because if you just broadcast the seeds onto a place that's covered in wild oats, most of those Cyphochlocra seedlings, even if they germinate, they'll be shaded out by the wild oats and they won't survive. So ideally, they should be started as plugs or liners in a nursery and then planted out. So, like, okay, let me let me give this a shot. And so the first season, I propagated about 100 stipopulchra. We planted them December of 2021. And by May of 2021, um, what we're looking at here are the first poppies that we have ever seen on that hillside in over four decades. So um, you see the flag shows stipopulchra stands here and there. And then some of the poppies we sowed, some of them were coming up as volunteers or more likely from those seeds that my mom had been tasking for years. And so it just, 
show the power of what these plants can do. And so we got really excited. And so this season I propagated another 400, which actually turns out to be too much for the space. So I ended up donating some elsewhere, but um, you'll see over here on the right-hand side, December, 2022 is the last December. We planted out the last of them. So the first cohort, we had 83% survival. Um, we planted out the second cohort, you know, which is close to 300 or so. Um, so it's 368 purple needle grass in the ground as of a month ago. And um, they got to get to work. So it's, uh, I have this dream of seeing this as a proper native grassland, a mini grassland someday. Um, yeah, okay. so nursery. Um, you can do a lot in a little space. Those two little tables are holding 100 glasses right there, or 98 on two trays. So you can do a lot with a small space. Barbara, I've, I've got a, a question for you. Yes. It was on the, the last, I'm on a smaller screen, the last picture you showed, it was, um, it was hard to see if you'd planted out um, purple needle grass starts or if those were seeds, because I can't really see the um, three inch, um, yeah, lighting and small and zoom. But three inch, um, they were in three inch pots. So they yeah. they were like this, in three inch pots, and they got planted out. And then we actually, um, my mom and I kind of felt like the plants were telling us to trim them back when we planted them, so they could really focus on putting in the roots. So that's what we did. So that might be why they look a little short. <laughs> Once we planted right. them out. And that I noticed that when you were just slightly closer to the screen, you were maybe closer to the microphone, uh, and I could hear you better. Oh, okay. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe you could just um, do that a little bit more. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, yes. Let me scooch in on my rolling chair and um, yeah, just just uh, pipe up if you you can't hear me. Um, I'm. I just realized there are questions coming up in the chat. I'm sorry I missed them. I um, I'll I'll go through those toward the end if that's okay and address all the questions that come up. So if you have more questions, please just keep populating the chat and uh, we can address those at the end. Okay, so I mentioned that the, uh, the garden was certified as a wildlife habitat and um, the certification is administered by the National Wildlife Federation and there's five kind of criteria that they look at. So they, um, you're required to have at least three sources of food, one source of water, a place where animals, wildlife can take shelter and cover from the elements and from predators, and um, a place where they can mate and raise their young, and then finally sustainable practices. Um, and so I'll speak to kind of the wildlife I've seen and how that came about. And I think it'll touch on all five of those criteria. So I just found as I was adding native plants that wildlife visitors started showing up more um, and birds and butterflies and bees and uh, moths and the usual suspects. And, um, and then simultaneously, I found that there were native plants that I didn't plant that started to show up. So I mentioned before a container garden is not very contain contained. It can spiral wildly out of control. And um, I have a big old black sage that I did not plant. I have front leaf pinstamen that I did not plant. Tomcat clover, miner's lettuce, um, didn't sow those seeds. I didn't plant those plants. They showed up and I, I can only think it was most likely the wildlife that brought them in. And so and I kind of love that um, image to the idea of like, I planted these plants to feed the wildlife. Now they're planting things like miner's lettuce that I can and did eat. So they were feeding me back, which I didn't expect and wasn't necessary, but I was very grateful. And speaking of food, I think one of the things I realized um, as the wildlife visitors started increasing are that the birds, um, I didn't know this before, they love their routines just like people and just like dogs. And so um, I have like an Anna's hummingbird who likes to show up around 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. every day to eat. Um, the first season, there was a dark eyed Junko who would come through every day, 2 p.m. on the dot um, and come hopping through looking for food. And so um, I just, I love the chance to have that intimacy of knowing 
that they do have these routines. And I, I don't know if, I'm sure there's many ways that you can learn that. I think for me, it was essential to have it right there at home to kind of share this space with them. It goes back to a big reason I did this was to prove out that you can bring the natural world right into your home and be a part. Um, and not only did birds eat, they made babies. So um, Anna's hummingbird built this nest in a camellia tree on my front porch. Um, I just, I love the architecture of that and it's so stunning. And then um, morning dove pair, they nested on the roof above my back patio. And one day I found this broken eggshell in one of my containers um, and it was fresh, like the lining was still wet, the blood vessels were still visible. And, and I read that what they do is, as, I imagine other birds do this too, as soon as the baby bird hatches, um, the parents throw the shell out of the nest so that the scent doesn't attract predators and also to keep the nest clean for the baby. And um, yeah, and so there are birds, um, monarch butterflies started visiting a couple of years ago, I, I've lived here for over 15 years and I've never seen a monarch and all of a sudden they started showing up. And I, just, I think with all these animals, especially with the monarchs, I just thought like, how did you find this? Because I live one block from a major LA thoroughfare and it is urban. I mean, it's loud and there's traffic and sirens and buildings around. And I was like, how, how did you guys find this? It's miraculous to me, and, and I'm so glad you did. So um, some other animals that found their way here, aphids, um, were a problem, especially in the first season because there was so much new growth um, with the young plants. But for me, I knew I did not want to use pesticides. That was really important to me. I know what they do up the food chain. I was not growing this garden just for aesthetics. Certainly aesthetics were important, but I was growing up for wildlife. And so I was like, I am not using pesticides. I'm just not using pesticides. I got to hold on and trust um, the natural world to take care of it. And they did. So hoverflies, um, like the one pictured here, and ladybugs, they manage the aphids now. And it's really, it's just not a, an issue in the garden. And yeah, it's just, it's lively here. There's never a dull moment here. Um, and it's a small space, but I spend hours sitting out there because I'm constantly just amazed at what I'm seeing. Uh, speaking of wildlife, I have um, a little video clip of the Anna's hummingbird that I mentioned, um, which I'll play for you. Um, before I do, I want to say, um, She's less than six feet away from me. You'll hear a neighbor's dog barking in the background. She's totally fearless. Um, she feels safe here. And the plant she's eating from is one of her favorites as you'll hear. So actually, I had sent this video to my parents and my dad pointed out that she does not miss a single flower on this plant and she never does. Um, other plants like penstemons and such, she might, you know, sip lightly here and there, but here she, she licks her plate clean on this plant and she loves it. And, um, and I love those little chirping sounds that she makes between each sip. It's, if there is some bird expert out there who can explain to me why that is, I would really love to know. I've imagined it's her saying yum after every bite, but I'm sure there's a more scientific explanation and it's probably much more interesting than mine. So I would love to know someday. There we go. Um, so speaking of that plant, um, I wanna talk about it a little bit more. So. I've, I've described the garden and how it's set up and how some of what it's done for wildlife. And it also, it feeds me. It's a place of contemplation and every plant has a story. Um, 
And I'm going to tell a story of this plant. Uh, so this is the hummingbird sage. You saw the bird was eating from, and it is the first plant I ever propagated from a cutting. Um, and she grew very slowly, but very symmetrically. So this is her um, very young stage. And and as she was, as this cutting was growing, I was like, this is really interesting to me because I think um, if you've seen hummingbird sages growing, you know they often tend to be very sort of Loosey goosey and floppy and whirly, and not this one. Um, she grew very slowly, but in a very organized and symmetrical um, pattern, and just seemed to almost be placing each leaf just very carefully. And it just kind of stuns me the elegance of this. It reminds me of like a haiku or origami or something like that. And so eventually she made a perfect little straight flower stalk. And um, one of the things, so I I volunteer at the Rancho Sierra Vista Nursery in the San Monica Mountains. And um, Antonio Sanchez is the manager of the nursery. And one of the things that I've heard him teach is with, uh, plant, um, with these kinds of plants that when they make that first flower stalk, that it's important to cut it off so that the plant will spread because if it flowers and goes to seed, it will think it's done. It's done its job, it's propagated itself and it can stop growing. So um, I was like, really? I, I really got to cut the flower stalk off? Um, seems like a lot, but, but I did. And um, took a deep breath, took a leap of faith, cut off the flower stalk. And then um, she began to propagate via rhizome or to spread via rhizome as, um, as they do. And so she made four rhizomes almost symmetrically. Um, so staying true to form and then made these beautiful flower stalks. And I was thrilled to see her growing. And as you can see, she got bumped up to a 21 inch planter there. Um, but as I was watching her grow in this new way, I noticed that original center stalk, which you can kind of see here, um, it started to turn kind of yellow and red and it didn't look as healthy as before. And um, I'm very attached to this plant. And so I took a photo to the nursery one day when I was volunteering and showed to Antonio and asked, I believe the exact question was, is she dying? Um, and a uh, worried plant mom. And he said, no, first of all, she's not dying because she's not just that center stalk, she is each of these four stalks here. She's spreading via, via rhizome, because it's all one plant. I'm like, okay, intellectually, that makes sense to me. And then he said that this is what plants that spread via rhizome do. Um, and as I mentioned, I am not a um, plant professional or an expert, so these are all things I'm learning along the way. He said plants that spread via rhizome, they'll do that. They'll spread via rhizome, the center will go dormant, perhaps die away, and they'll just keep spreading out. Um, there is, I imagine some of you have heard of, uh, there's a creosote bush um, in the Mojave Desert called King Clone that's probably about 12,000 years old. And it's a gigantic ring, but it's one plant that's just kept spreading in that rhizomatous fashion over millennia. And I'm like, okay, okay, this all makes sense. This is how she grows. But so I'm like, okay, my plant's not dying, but why do I still feel the sense of loss? Because that part of her here that was just so exceptional and unusual um, was going away. And so I was like, I still feel a sense of loss even though she's not dying. And, and it made me think about those times in our lives when we have to give up something that's good. Um, and I don't mean giving up something that's bad because if you're giving up something in your life that shouldn't be there, then it just shouldn't be there, right? But sometimes you have to give up something in your life that's good and lovely and maybe even feels perfect at the time. Um, but you have to give it up in order to grow. And, and yet this, there's still this sense of loss. And so I found myself just meditating on that um, for myself as inspiration for things that I'm writing, um, for talks that I've given, and honestly, for choices that I've made in my personal life. And so um, this plant has 
taught me a lot in a short in her short life. And then the coda um, to this story. So this the plant was looking like this in May of last year, and by December. Um, she looked like this, so she got real big. Um, I mentioned um, sustainable practices earlier, no pesticides, um, but that plants need fertilizer. So I fertilized the garden typically with a ad hoc mix of coffee grounds, cinnamon, um, which has potassium, and worm fasting. So I fertilized all the plants in October, and by December, the hummingbird stage was looking like this. And so something, right, like that you have to grow so that you can feed more hummingbirds um, because this plant can certainly feed a lot more hummingbirds than this plant could. So that is kind of the reward for letting go of something good so that you can reach out for what is better and what is best. And the other thing I'd like to say is that if you do use that fertilizer mix, um, your garden will smell like pumpkin spice latte. And I like pumpkin spice latte, so I thought it was nice. I mentioned as a place of contemplation, um, and an extension I found to that is that unexpectedly, this garden became a connection to my past. So I am Korean American. I was born and raised in this country, and my grandparents on both sides lived in Korea, so I didn't get to see much of them. Um, my maternal grandfather passed away I visited a few times when I was very young, but um, I didn't get to see them as much as I would have liked. And my maternal grandfather passed away when I was very young, uh, maybe three or four or so, I think. And I was talking with my mom last year about my container garden and she mentioned, she's like, you know, your grandfather had a container garden too. I was like, really? And she said, yeah, she said he loved flowers. Um, and back then, for to be able to say my grandfather had a container garden is incredible because my grandparents, they survived Japanese colonialism and World War II and the Korean War. Times were hard and living was tough and living space was tight um, and people didn't really garden as such per se very much because it was just really hard. Um, but my grandfather loved flowers so much that he wanted the flowers where he lived. And, and then I realized that um, my favorite photos of my maternal grandparents, which you see here, I realized they all have plants in the background. They all have container plants. And I just, sorry. Um, I, yeah, if you look at this and you'll see those little pots arranged back there, the planters and so on. And I, just, I look at it and I don't remember, if I ever did see it, I don't remember seeing it because I was so young, but it feels so familiar, it hurts. And I love my garden for giving me that connection to my grandparents. Um, and whenever I am there, I feel close to them. So that has meant a great deal to me and was very unexpected. And so finally, to recap, I think these are the things that my garden and my plants have taught me. Um, you've seen this is not necessarily a how-to presentation. I think um, I think most people don't like being told what to do. And um, this is not a presentation telling anybody what to do, but it is what I want to share is what the plants have taught me. And I think when we let these native plants become our teachers, it's the lessons are um, incredible. And honestly, I am very new to this. I've only been doing this a few years and I know I've just scratched the surface, but in humility, these are the lessons that I have learned so far that even the littlest garden can support an abundance of life. Um, as I mentioned, the bird life, the pollinators, all the traffic and the vitality that I see come through here, it's enthralling. And um, 
between the wildlife and the plants themselves, the garden, it surprises me every day. Um, I'll see it. I mentioned the chia coming up in the hanging baskets. I certainly didn't sew, but there it is. And there's a surprise or a nursery, um, something happening in the nursery where I was like, I don't know if these seeds are doing anything. And then two months later, they start germinating. I'm like, okay, okay, there you go. Look at you go and look how cute your cotyledons are. So um, in the garden, it can teach us about the natural world and our place in it. And I use that phrase, the natural world, very intentionally. Um, indigenous languages, uh, many indigenous languages in California and around the world, they don't necessarily have a word for nature the way that we use it in American English. So in American English, we say things like, I love nature, I love spending time in nature, I want to help nature, all with the best of intentions, but in saying it like that, we speak of nature as if it is something outside of ourselves. But I think indigenous people around the world understand that we are ourselves part of the natural world. We and the plants and the animals and the fungi and all of it, that we're all one. And even in this little urban space with everything in containers, I've found this garden has taught me about kind of what I can do to nurture the natural world and to nurture um, my partners in it. And in return, how they can feed me and nourish me physically and emotionally and spiritually every day. I've also learned um, Little Garden, it can bounce back from our mistakes. So I think if there were any takeaway that I would love for somebody to have from this, who maybe you know, doesn't have land, would lo love to have plants, doesn't know if they can, I'd say just go for it um, because try things and you will make mistakes. If you try anything worth doing, you will make mistakes, but sometimes the plants bounce back, sometimes they won't, but we can bounce back from our own mistakes and we can learn from them and do better and, and take lessons moving forward and improve upon what we've done before. So just go for it. And do your research, of course, but expect to make mistakes and um, forgive yourself the way the plants forgive us and learn from that. And then finally, um, speaking of forgiveness, this little space, um, it lends peace. And I feel so much peace whenever I'm in this space. And one of the most rewarding aspects of having this garden has been when I have friends and neighbors come by and visit. So often they say to me that they feel peace here. And, and that means everything to me. And I am so grateful for these plants and the way that they lend that peace, um, especially I'm sure the room therapy plants has something to do with that peace that people feel. And I am filled with gratitude for it. So and finally, I am grateful to all of you and to the CNPS South Coast chapter for inviting me to speak and for listening and engaging. And yeah, I, just, I want to say thank you. I see some questions coming up in the chat that I am happy to address and I can dive right into those unless Brent, you have um, anything you wanted to bring up. Um, no, if, if you'd like to go through the questions, that's fine. If you'd like me to maybe read them to you in the group, that's that's fine too. What's your preference? Oh, actually, if you could read them, um, that would help so that I don't get distracted as I go down the chain. Okay, uh, yeah, well, you. I'll start with the, the most recent one. And Dee wrote, um, it is definitely good for the soul and both physical and mental health to be in tandem and working with the earth. I love the rejuvenation of nature too. And I guess I'll, I'll second that. I thought your talk was gonna be more about gardening and it, and it verged into um, a lot of feelings that uh, that resonated with me. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emily Bowyer uh, commented, she says, uh, I like the tall monkey flower in the back. She's long. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Esme says, uh, they're beautiful teachers. Thank you, Barbara. I think she's referring to your, your uh, potted friends. Yes. Uh, uh, the Sattlers were saying, uh, 
Could you please discuss the soil you use in the pots? It looks like you have some plants in pots that I would expect would need much more room. Yes, absolutely. So um, I suppose that's really a two-part question. I'll address the soil first. That might be a bit easier. Um, I use four different kinds of soil in the garden. Um, where do I start? I'll start in the nursery. So in the nursery, I start seeds, the first kind of seed starter mix, where it's, obviously I start seeds in that. Um, I have a lightweight soil mix. It's one part potting soil, one part perlite, one part seed starter mix. Um, I've learned that from a couple different nurseries, from RSB and from Theodore Payne as well. And that's really good for very young seedlings that you're bringing up out of trays, out of seed starter mix, um, because it's lightweight, so the roots can really develop more readily. Um, there's regular potting soil right out of the bag. That is what most of the larger plants go into. Um, and then the fourth soil mix I have is a 50-50 blend of coarse sand and peat or seed starter mix, which is specifically for calicordis. So that's the seed mix. Um, in terms of the plants, I don't know um, which plants they're referring specifically to, but I can certainly think of some things. Um, I think... Let's see, there is a bush poppy there in the background. Um, that soil, I actually blended a bunch of extra perlite in there because in native nature, it likes rocky, fast draining soil. And so I took potting soil, mixed a whole bunch of extra perlite in there. That was about four years ago and it is fine, it's happy. Um, so I see your point about how like soil mix can influence and what does well where. Um, I'm not sure what else I have. I mentioned it before we actually got into the proper meeting. I accidentally grew a Catalina cherry tree. Um, we're going to see how that goes. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for a container plant, but I was eating a Catalina cherry one day and threw it into a pot of spent soil. And then a month later, I had a little seedling and I said, oh no. And then I was like, well, we'll see what happens. Um, I think I've got a picture of it possibly somewhere here. There we go. I'm still screen sharing, right? Yeah, so there were some pleasant surprises um, since we were talking about plants that are too big for their, surprisingly big to be in a pot. First of all, these pots are big. They are 30 to 40 gallons, but um, this is the Catalina cherry tree. It's almost four feet, eight inches um, as of a few days ago. So it is almost as tall as me and it's happy, it just keeps growing. So I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do, but as long as you're happy and healthy and you tell me you're happy here, I, I'll leave you be. Um, these are Black Sage and Toyon, um, which volunteered. Not really sure, honestly, if I would recommend Toyon in a pot because that can be a big one, but it volunteered. So again, happy, healthy, how it does. And then um, the Lepic fragrance was very intentional. Um, I thought it could do well in a large enough pot and it really has. Um, this was in a four inch pot nine months ago. It looks like this now. And one of the other things I've sort of learned through this process is that plants that are propagated well are more likely to thrive. And I look at this one, which I got at Theodore Payne, and I just think you must have had a very happy childhood. Um, yeah, so it's doing well. Okay. D is asking, um, do you have better results with plastic, ceramic, or terracotta pots? Good question. I grabbed whatever I could from friends and neighbors. Um, so I've just, I haven't real, the plastic pots seem fine. Um, and I've seen, like, I've, when I was reading up on Calicordus propagation, I was seeing some detail about how in certain climates, terracotta pots are better and other climates, plastic ones are better because you're sort of measuring the balance of um, kind of moisture in the air and the heat in the air versus what's in the soil. Uh, I have found, I would say the majority of the pots are plastic or resin simply because I also need to be able to move them around occasionally and I physically don't think I can move a 40 gallon terracotta pot honestly, as much as I'd love to be able to do so. 
um, and they seem fine. I think it's it, it's kind of managing that balance of moisture versus um, material and so on. Yeah. Okay, Melissa uh, tells says that uh, your words came from the heart. Thank you for your heart song on the teachings of California native plant companions. Uh, and then the the Sattlers at were curious about that um, bush or tree poppy, and I was too. Um, I thought it was a Carpinteria californica, but I was wrong. I think it's a bush poppy. Yeah. Um, and are the photos current or are they um, yeah. a year old or so? How is that done as it's gotten older? Yes, um, this is a bush poppy right here. So that is current. That is uh, within the last week or so. It started, it's been flowering every season I've had it. Um, it grows slowly partly probably because I starved it for the near first 10 months of its life um, but so, so it grew more slowly and then when I started feeding it started growing more but it's been happy I don't know if I have a close I don't think I have a close-up in this presentation but the leaves have good color no scarring no issues on them um, it flowers regularly from I know in, in the wild, they flower from February through April. Mine flowers from February through July. And um, I have not tried propagating the seeds, but uh, that's mostly because it is an incredibly difficult uh, genus to propagate. So I am not up yet for baking and boiling and smoking water and all the things that it needs to thrive. Yeah, um, I noticed that a lot of your plants look like there's kind of solitary occupants in their pots. And I'm wondering if that's a pragmatic choice or an aesthetic one. I did see a little lupin next to um, your uh, hummingbird sage when it was a young one, but uh, I don't think that persisted. So- um, No, it was an annual, yeah. How, how, um, how do you choose that? Solitary or, or multiples in a pot? Right, so I'm thinking through sort of what's in my garden. So I think through a few things. One is what the size of the plant is likely to be. I want to give it some room to grow. Um, if I do group some together, uh, for example, um, yeah, I've got some hummingbird sage mixed up with Catalina cherry, the black sage and toyon together, things like that. Um, obviously I try to pick plants that do well together in the wild because then they'll have similar sun and water requirements and things like that. Um, but most of them I went with larger pots and wanted to give them room to grow and thrive and, and fill that space. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, and uh, Rosalie is asking um, how you prepared the soil on that hillside that you showed a picture of with the needle grass. Um, I did not. The soil was soil. Um, it's it's a there's a specific name for that soil type I can't remember. It's on the USGS site, but it is about thirty five percent clay. Um, if you look at the USGS soil web map, you can find the um, soil composition for pretty much any place really in the US and um, USGS says it's 35% clay. My direct experience with it certainly bears out. And we, I guess we didn't do any amendments or anything like that. In fact, um, the first cohort of Stipopulchra that we planted out, the hundred of them, um, I mentioned we had 83% survival. That was with zero irrigation. No irrigation, no fertilizer, nothing. We just soaked them really, really well when we planted them, soaked them really well again a month later, and they took off. They are native. But what about the weeds, that, the non-native grasses that were there previously? Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry. You, so you, you meant um, kind of that not the soil composition itself. So uh, mowing between McLeod and weed whipping, uh, we mowed the, we planted them out, we mowed the wild oats and then they would come up and we basically kept mowing them before they would go to seed. Um, there's still some coming up this season, but it's significantly less than the prior year. So 
Um, I've talked to people who specialize in grassland restoration and they're like, yeah, you know, like two to three years, those wild oats seeds should be depleted if you keep with, up with the mowing before they go to seed. All right, I think we got to the end. Now, if I didn't get to your question, you could, you know, take yourself off mute and ask. Uh, I don't have enough um, screen real estate to see everybody all at once, so I can't see a raised hand. Um, I'll jump in real quick with a question. You said you had, <clears throat> sorry, I'm choking at the same time. Um, <clears throat> you use coffee grounds, cinnamon, and two other things as your fertilizer. Oh, yes. Uh, coffee grounds, used coffee grounds, stunt coffee yeah. grounds, because um, I, I want to drink my coffee first. And that's a lot of nitrogen. Um, cinnamon has potassium and worm castings, worm castings. which has right. assorted magic. Super. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Where do you get the cinnamon in bulk? Costco. Do you find that cinnamon much. has a, it doesn't have another property that you appreciate, such as deterring um, I don't know, insects that you don't want? You know, it probably does. Cinnamon is interesting. Um, cinnamon is also a rooting hormone. So if you're propagating from cuttings, um, it, so when I propagate from cuttings, I don't use the powdered or liquid rooting hormone that you normally get at like a garden supply store. Um, I, well, I personally, I use fresh aloe gel from my aloe plants. Aloe is a rooting hormone. Uh, so it's cinnamon. Um, you think what else? Um, aspirin, if you have it around the house, because it's based on salicylic acid, which comes from willow trees. Um, if you grind up aspirin, mix it up in water, that can be a rooting hormone. Willow bark tea, but that sounds like a lot of work to make. And then um, my favorite uh, all natural rooting hormone that I've never tried, but just makes me laugh is human saliva. So I um, have never tried spitting on my cuttings, but I told a friend of mine this and she tried it and she told me that her cuttings were rooting better than they had before. So um, yeah, that, I, I realize that's a little bit of a tangent, but since you're asking about other properties of cinnamon, I think I'm sure cinnamon does other things, but one of the things, I, I wanna make sure my plants are getting their NPK. All right, and Julie Decker is asking if you use the, the aloe and cinnamon to propagate the hummingbird sage. I use the aloe. Okay, and uh, D notes that you can get worm castings in bulk from Rainbow Mealworms in Compton, uh, 129 East Spruce Street. Thanks, Dee. Uh, any other questions? How, how much cinnamon per plant would you use? I wing it. Totally honest here. Um, I feel like with chemical fertilizers, you have to be very particular about measuring it out because they can be very intense. Um, the cinnamon, honestly, I just kind of sprinkle it. I'm not putting it out in spoonfuls, if that helps you give a sense of scale. Like I take a sprinkler and I sort of like one of those um, spice, spice jars, that's the word. Uh, and um, just sprinkle a light dusting onto the soil. And then worm castings, I'll do a handful or two handfuls. Um, depending on the size of the pulpit. And coffee grounds, I just keep putting out whatever it is that I drink. Hmm. All right. Well, unless there's any other questions, then thank you so much, Barbara. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh. oh, I saw somebody say something. Thank you so much for the chance to meet with you all. And um, share my garden with you. I really appreciate it. All right. Emily Bowyer says a uh, brilliant presentation. Thank you. So all Thanks, right. Emily. I'm going to I'm going to stop the recording and uh, you can hang out for a few more minutes while I shut the meeting down. <laughs>